Welcome to Suffolk Matters, where all of Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News, opinions, and insights you won't hear anywhere else. Welcome to another edition of Suffolk Matters on Walk 97.5 and 94.3 The Shark, where Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News and views you can't hear anywhere else. So my guest this morning is Maribel Gomez, Esquire. She's an executive board member of the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association. Good morning, Maribel. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, and I'm glad you took some time to join us today. You know, there's so much I think we can talk about, but I think first and foremost, uh, we should do a little introduction about yourself. Just let us know a little bit of who you are and what it is you do. So uh, my name is Maribel Gomez. I'm an attorney with the law offices of Gray and Gray right here in Farmingdale. I practice plaintiff's personal injury uh, our firm does workers' compensation and social security disability. In addition to that, I'm also the treasurer of the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association, who is a group of uh, Latino attorneys uh, whose mission is just to advance the Hispanic community and the uh, Hispanic attorneys as a whole. Sure. So not just professionally, but the but the full Hispanic community and 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 represent their needs uh, in a legal capacity. Correct. Yeah. We you know uh, our goal is to support and educate the Hispanic community in whatever their needs are, uh, and help advance that community. So just talking about workers' compensation, maybe a little bit. Uh, so that's basically anyone with a job that gets injured on the job has the ability to seek out your firm to see if there's any uh, if there's any claim there. Correct. So, you know, generally when you get injured on the job, um, whose fault it was really doesn't matter. Right. If, if you're injured and you're in the course of your employment, you're entitled to certain benefits uh, under New York State statute, the workers' compensation laws. In addition to that, you might also have a lawsuit against a negligent individual. And that's the area of law that I really practice is the personal injury portion of it. Um, In conjunction with those two things, if you are out of work for extended period of time and you have a disability, you may qualify for social security disability. So our firm really handles all three aspects of a case surrounding any work-related or or any injury whatsoever. Sure. And, you know, I think it's important to understand that these, you know, these functions, you know, what your firm does, uh, you guys are experts in an area of the law that uh, most folks don't understand. I mean, some people can get injured at work, never lose a day of work, uh, but have sustained an injury at work. You know, maybe, I don't know, eye strain, some sort of wrist pain from repetitive motions or whatever else. And they're working and they're working and they're working. They don't realize that they can actually come see you guys and get help with that stuff. So uh, to that extent, there are probably a number of injuries that, you know, would immediately come to mind, like I need to see a workers' comp attorney, but there are a number of other areas where they wouldn't even think that they could go see a workers' comp attorney, but they could and should. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, when you think of an injury, especially one at work or or something like that, you, you think of the happening of a specific event. Uh, something falling on you, you falling off of something. Right. Uh, But you never think of the occupational hazards that can arise from those work-related jobs, uh, tasks, Um, hearing loss, vision loss. The big one, yep. Things things of that nature uh, that people really don't think about often but are work-related injuries that uh, deserve compensation. Yeah, and so anyone listening, if you have a job and you're working and uh, you feel like there may be some sort of injury related to your job, I mean, what you should do is seek out an expert. It is uh, difficult, complicated law, and there are specialists that deal specifically with this. And I appreciate you shedding some light on it. Thank you for uh, having me. So, you know, again, as, as uh, someone involved in work, workers' compensation, and you say specifically you look at, at personal injury, what, is a, what does a typical day look like for you? You know, a typical day for me not only involves the legal aspect of a personal injury case, sure. um, the research, the, you know, the advocating. There's also a psychological and an emotional component to as to it as well. I would imagine, yeah. You're dealing with uh, 
clients who have been injured, some catastrophically, sure. and this has impacted their lives greatly uh, in all sorts of ways. And they're emotional. They're emotional. They're scared. They don't know what the future has in store for them. So in addition to letting them know what their legal rights and advocating for them on that aspect, I have to give them the comfort uh, to know that they will get out of this. We are going to fight for them. And um, hopefully it will be a successful outcome for them based on the law. Sure. And I think, you know, folks having managed expectations in that way, coming in, seeing someone, talking to them, and getting a real sense of what's going on, what may or may not happen, I think that takes a little of the mystery out of it. And I think that uh, goes a long way to helping someone focus on, you know, recovery rather than, you know, stressing over the legal aspect. Well, yeah, d- absolutely. I mean, you know, they, like I said, you have to give the client a comfort level so they can, you know, they can focus on their medical treatment and their recovery. That is their goal. I, you know, I tell my clients all the time, your job is to get better. My job is to look at the law and apply the facts of your case to the law to get you the best results possible. So I, I want to take that fear out of the client. I don't want them to worry about the legal aspect of it. I want sure. them to get better on their recovery. No, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. So I want to just go into a little bit more, you know, do, do a deeper dive on, on your work with the uh, Long Island Hispanic Bar Association. So can you tell me just a little bit of the history of the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association, how it got started? Sure. So the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association was originally founded as the Suffolk County Hispanic Bar Association Mm -hmm. back in 2001 by um, the acting family court judge and Supreme Court Justice Philip Goglis, Mm -hmm. uh, along with uh, a number of Hispanic attorneys who would determine to protect the civil and the political rights of the Hispanic community in the county uh, through their dedication to the law. In approximately 2004, 2005, the founders decided that they needed to adjust the name of the association to better reflect and expand upon their member base uh, into Nassau County. So by resolution, they changed the name to the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association, also known as LIBA. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, so I would imagine, uh, but I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but do you, do you find that there are certain issues the Hispanic community faces, um, you know, as, as a growing population here on Long Island, uh, and, and, you know, uh, all, of, all of the different ways they're, you know, acclimating to life here in Suffolk County. Uh, do you find that there's certain issues that just keep coming up uh, that, that need particular attention in the Hispanic community? One of the things that comes to mind instantly mm-hmm. is uh, the Hispanic community's um, lack of resources or, or knowing where to get resources. Sure. And that's very important, and I think that that's where LIBA, Long Island Hispanic Bar, Mm -hmm. really comes into play and has really focused, at least since I've been a a member of the association. Um, Our goal is to get that information out to the Spanish community uh, so they know where to go if they need something, who to reach out to, what the process is, and give them that comfort level to say, hey, this is out there. We can help you get it. Right. You know, let's do it. Understanding their rights, right? And that goes a long way towards combating discrimination, which I think is very important. Yeah, well, you know, education is empowerment. Sure. Uh, So that that is our that's our goal is to empower our community to give them the confidence that they need to move forward and to advance in life. So now not only is the board treasurer, but you're also the co chair of the association's community outreach committee. Uh, Tell me a little bit about what that is and and what you do there. Yeah, so community outreach is what actually drew me to the association. Mm -hmm. That's where my heart really is. Right. Um, You know, I was drawn to LIBA because I saw all of the different uh, fundraising and 
and events that they did for our community leaders. Sure. Uh, we host events such as next week we have our annual holiday party and coat drive where we've already uh, amassed hundreds and hundreds of warm winter coats for all to be distributed to all our community leaders. So we're hoping that next week we collect more coats. Uh, you know, right after that is a prom dress drive, food drives. Sure. Um, and in addition to that, going back to the education portion of it, you know, we conduct many information seminars, uh, know your rights clinics, uh, wherein mm-hmm. we go to a local library or community center and there's an attorney in a specialized area of law and, and he or she will give a seminar on what their rights are in whether it's family law or landlord tenant or personal injury, sure. you know. Uh, yeah. So that that's very helpful for the community. No, that's great. And, you know, there's so many things there. I think it's probably a great opportunity just to ask you if someone wants to know more, uh, wants to get involved in, you know, the prom dress drive, the coat drive, uh, get involved in any of these legal seminars, anything else, what's the best way for someone to, to kind of get more information? You guys have a website? Is it a phone number? Sure. So yeah. I, I would direct them immediately to mm-hmm. our website, which mm-hmm. is www dot l i h b a dot org and there's a wealth of information on there regarding upcoming events legal seminars cle's um everywhere that liba is or mm-hmm. what liba does is on that website we encourage attorneys to become members uh we have a member class for non-attorneys as well uh which has been uh a big source of membership lately. Uh, so I encourage everyone and anyone to look on our website and see the different classes of membership that we have and join. No, that's great. You know, and as you grow, you, you, you grow the community as well and all Absolutely. of the goals within that community. So that's, that's great. Uh, and just for anyone who wants that again, it's www.lihba.org. I'll mention it a few more times as we talk. So over the past several years, the association's grown uh, exponentially. You know, again, you had mentioned uh, starting in Suffolk and expanding into Nassau. Uh, you guys have about 100 attorneys or possibly more than 100 attorneys, uh, professionals, law students. Uh, we think that's incredible. Um, but, but within the history of what you guys have been doing, um, you personally worked with many up-and-coming lawyers, uh, and specifically some notable alumni, uh, a past president of the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association is Hector LaSalle. Uh, and he's been nominated for the position of chief judge for the New York State Court of Appeals. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because this is now someone, you know, you've worked with and that you know, and this is something that's ongoing in the news. And, you know, I'm, I'm on uh, the labor side of things, you know, looking, for, looking after working people, and some of the folks in the labor community uh, very much love this appointment and other people don't. And I just wanted to, I wanted to be able to spend some time with you just to get an understanding of, you know, who, who you know um, Hector LaSalle to be. So, you know, first and foremost, uh, I'm, I'm honored and I'm proud to be in the presence of such great leaders from this organization and, and jurists especially of Latino descent, sure. uh, Judge LaSalle being one of them. Um, I'm immensely proud of that. And, you know, what I will say about Justice LaSalle is that I know him to be true to himself. I know him to be an advocate of the law, and I know him to apply the law fairly and equitably. Um for those that don't understand, especially in the work uh, force, the labor unions, what has been put out there regarding some of his decisions or have been uh, com- the, the decisions that have been pointed out and, and are being used against him, it's a mischaracterization mischaracter- of the decisions written. Um, and uh, the decision actually has nothing to do with being against any labor unions or 
or the workforce itself. Sure. Uh, you know, and I read, it was a key decision that someone had brought to my attention, uh, which I went through and I read myself, uh, and his application of the law was, I believe, entirely correct. The way, the way things needed to be looked at in that given situation was consistent with federal and state law. Uh, a ruling outside of what he did would mean a change to the application of existing rules. And you, you always have to worry about when a decision comes out from a judge and that judge changes precedent, changes the way things are interpreted, How what is that ripple effect going to be across the board? And that should always be part of their decision-making process. Uh, but being in the labor community, understanding what those rights are, and seeing that particular decision, uh, I I don't see how he got it wrong. Sure, and listen, Justice LaSalle has the utmost respect for precedent and, and the judicial mm -hmm. process. Um, and that's what you want in a jurist. Y you want someone who's going to read the law and apply that law to the specific facts of the case sure. that, he, that he or she is deciding. And uh, like I said, Justice LaSalle will not sidestep precedent just to bend to anyone's uh, or advance anyone's political agenda. Sure. That's just not who he is. And and to maintain the the integrity of our court system, that's exactly what we need. You know, that's exactly where I wanted to go with that. You know, the Court of Appeals is a very important part of our legal system. Uh, and, and it has political appointments, but that person that gets appointed should not be political in their application of the law. And that's what I like about what I read about Justice LaSalle. So, um, so again, as I mentioned, this is a significant nomination. Um, and, and, you know, we talked a little bit about what Judge LaSalle brings to the table. Um, but I guess the next step in this process, in the nomination process, would be, you know, public hearing in front of the New York State Senate. And we've, you know, we've had some phone calls with folks just trying to figure out what their thought process was. And uh, on, on most of the levels of the folks that we've spoken to, their concern is to get the best possible judge. Uh, and, and, and they're not concerned politically. Um, but there are a handful of folks that are concerned politically and that is because they have a political agenda in mind. Uh, from, from my standpoint, I don't want someone, again, I understand it's a political appointment, but I don't want someone in that court making decisions based on politics, based on a particular party, based on, you know, it's the application of the law. Uh, so I guess with that in mind, I mean... Look, uh, I'm going to say this. <clears throat> Judge LaSalle's nomination was not created in a vacuum, mm -hmm. Okay. The governor nominated Judge LaSalle after a careful review of all the candidates by the Commission on Judicial Nomination. They reviewed the candidates' record, character, temperament, professional aptitude, and their overall qualifications for, for this position. Justice LaSalle stood out from the rest and was found to be a well-qualified candidate. He was not only deemed well qualified by the commission but by various law uh excuse me bar associations in the state including new york state bar association uh, new york city bar association uh new york state trial lawyers not only deemed him well qualified they deemed him highly qualified and highly recommended him to the to the governor so simply put he's the right man for the job you know i back him long island hispanic uh bar association backs him because he is the most qualified. We believe that Judge LaSalle's background experience and record is going to enrich the court's diversity mm -hmm. and will strengthen the court. And I have to say, the amount of people that came out, I mean, you mentioned a handful, but there is a laundry list. Even on the governor's website, uh, which makes the announcement, the amount of people diverse from across the state that had nothing but good things to say you know, to me, that's all on its own. That's very encouraging. To say that Judge, Judge LaSalle is a conservative jurist is such a fallacy, especially when you have other jurists, such as former Chief Judge Lippman, who is known to be um, a liberal judge mm -hmm. and a progressive judge. Mm -hmm. 
supporting Judge LaSalle. Right. So, you know, it it really is a smear campaign sure. uh, driven by a political agenda. And, you know, that kind of opens the door. Uh, to, for me, uh, some of the sense that I get, behind the scenes at least, is some of these conversations are leading towards, you know, again, we talked about the concept of, yes, it's a political appointment, but the job itself shouldn't be political in nature. And I think some of the people that are looking to to make a different appointment are really looking for someone that's going to drive their political agenda, which is not what this court should do. It's yeah. not what the court should do. It's not what the court is intended to do. Right. Uh, and, and it's not the role of the court. No justice legislates from the bench. That's right. just how it is. And, and that's what they want him to do. And he will not fold to that. And we should not want our judges to fold to that. Right. That breaks the entire system. Yeah, we do not need the Court of Appeals being viewed in the state of New York like many Americans view the Supreme Court now, right? There are things that are happening on the Supreme Court level that, that true or false, I don't want to speculate one way or the other, but the popular perception is that it is entirely political in nature, and New York State Court of Appeals should not be that way, should not be perceived that way. Uh, folks trying to steer things in a particular direction to achieve a particular political outcome. That's not what this process is about. This is about serving the people. It's about serving the law and the law the way it is. That That's exactly right. That's exactly how it is. That's the way it should be. And if you don't like the outcome, you have options. We have a system of in course. place for that. Of course. There is a legislative process in place specifically for that, but that's not the role of the judiciary. I agree. I agree. And listen, you know, the, the types of cases that end up in front of this part of the court, you, you, you really want stability. You want the current application of the law, like you say, not, not legislating from the bench. Uh, so, again, uh, politics aside, you know, uh, folks with particular agendas looking for particular outcomes – uh, the, the research that I've done uh, shows, shows to me a justice that's going to be fair in his application of the law. And that's what I think the people of New York State need in this appointment. So. Absolutely. So I guess, you know, let's, let's speculate. We'll move to the future a little bit. You know, there's always a little bit of heat with some of these things, right? Uh, and, and the process will bear out. But I'm going to assume uh, that this appointment's going to go through. And with that in mind, it's it's a crazy question to ask someone, but, you know, this person that you know, what advice would you have for them uh, when they're appointed and they're in and they're, and they're doing their job? I would be remiss to say that I have any advice or words of wisdom for someone who I respect so highly and I deem so knowledgeable. Um, however, with that being said... <laughs> From a personal perspective, I sure. would say that um, I would tell him to stay the course. I would say I would tell him that at the end of the day, that all we're left with as individual people is our integrity. Sure. And uh, we are so proud of how he has represented the Latino community and how far he has advanced the profession um, as a whole. Right. Uh, he's done a phenomenal job. We, su I support him. Liba supports him, and there's so many others out there that sure. support him. Sure. And you know, uh, it's it's worth saying. You know, while being from Hispanic descent, uh, this is this is an excellent judge, right? And and being Hispanic happens to be an aspect of what he. That's is. that's just the gravy on top. Right. That's just right. the gravy on top. Uh, you know, as as I mentioned before. It's about the best man for the job. Right. Just Justice LaSalle's, not only his record and his experience speak for themselves, we're talking about over 5,000 cases that he's presided over. Sure. Okay. Out of those 5,000 cases, only a handful were cherry picked to try to of smear course. him. Of course. So, you know, I challenge, you know, these, the opposition, let's call them. Right to go through all 5,000 cases and really give a full rendering of what his decisions really say. Right. And, and, how, and let's see how conservative they actually think he is. 
There are a number of decisions. People versus Benitez is is one specific case that mm-hmm. comes to mind. Right. Where Justice LaSalle, uh, you know, overturned a conviction on on prosecutorial uh, misconduct, Brady violations. He, mm-hmm. I mean, he's all over that stuff. So to say that he's conservative. Uh, again, it's just an outright lie, and sure. it's just a smear campaign. Well, I, you know, listen, on political narratives, we've seen this, you know, we've seen this forever in this country, but, you know, I've dealt with it specifically over the past decade or so. Uh, when when they're driving a political narrative, they don't want to look at the full story, and they don't want to complain about the truth as it is. It is a cherry-picking. It is a, you know, we want to make a particular case. We want to be able to use these talking points find the cases that allow me to make those, you know, make sure. those claims. Uh, but again, when you look at the body of work, it tells a very different story. That's right. And, and you know, we could, we could do that with any jurist that we have. If sure. we went through uh, a number of the, the judges that we have on the bench and went through each and every one of their case, we could cherry pick too. And, and many of them would not pass muster. Well, listen, I you know, I hate to bring the feds into this again, but, uh, you know, there have been promises made by folks being considered for the Supreme Court, and they said, I'm absolutely going to, and then they don't. Yeah. They go and do what we all knew they were going to do anyway. Absolutely. So uh, having somebody with a body of work represented uh, by the decisions they've made, I think, if you look at the, at the entirety of that body of work, that speaks to the man that's being considered for the appointment. Uh, the cherry picking on the cases, uh, again, the areas of concern. Uh, when I read the decisions and my understanding of the law, and again, listen, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I speak to lawyers, and I say, okay, this is what I see. This is what's going on as, as best I can tell, and I get their input. Uh, but it paints a very different picture. You know, when, again, when you're doing a political hit job, you just look for the things that support your narrative. It does. And and you bring up a very interesting and important point is you're not a lawyer, but you've taken the time to speak to Mm -hmm. lawyers and understand the cases that are being referred to, which is very important. You know, I'm the type of person that I don't take anyone's word for anything. I research it for myself and I draw my own conclusions to based on what I read and what I see. And I think that uh, generally uh, the public uh, are our senators need to do that. Get a deeper understanding for what you're being told. Uh, research it for yourself and form your own opinions on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, the phrase that comes to mind, we've all heard it before, trust but verify. That's right. You know, I talk to a lot of people. They tell me their side of the story. Then I go in and I look for myself, right? And that's the best way to have an informed opinion is not just accept somebody's word for it. Uh, I think that's politically how we get things messed up in this country is you listen to one side or one particular news station and they tell you this is the way the world is. If you listen to the opposing side, you would think the world is another way. Right. And if we all just did our homework and thought it through for ourselves, I think we'd all have a difference of That's opinion. It. That's exactly right. So I want to, I just want to, once again, I want to touch on the website for the Long Island Hista- Hispanic Bar Association. Uh, for those interested, www.lihba.org. That's www.lihba.org. Uh, and remember, there's a coat drive going on now. There'll be a prom dress drive. There's all sorts of educational opportunities there and ways to get involved and help uh, help be involved in this community and, and advance the needs of the Hispanic community. Uh, Maribel, I have the opportunity. I don't always get the opportunity, but I have the opportunity today. You know, I had a bunch of questions I was curious about, and I asked you about, uh, but is there anything that you'd like our listeners to know that I didn't touch on today? Just one thing, uh, well, two things. The first is to add to the events that LIBA is has, I'd also like to mention it goes uh, it, toe-to-toe with the education aspect of it. I'd like the listeners to know that if there's any one that is considering law school, anyone that is in law school and is having financial difficulty, look to LIBA. Every year we host, in September, we host an annual scholarship and installation gala where we award thousands of dollars in scholarships to deserving law students. You know, this year, Judge LaSalle, actually, I'm proud to announce, will be our keynote speaker. Awesome. So that's going to be a wonderful event. We're excited about that. 
Um, but there is a way, you know, to advance. Don't don't be constrained by by finances. If law is what you're looking for or want to pursue, please reach out to our our, our organization. And there's so many others that have similar scholarship funds that can assist you in that aspect. Yeah, that's awesome. So again, my guest this morning, Maribel Gomez, Esquire. Uh, she's an executive board member of the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association. I thank you for taking some time to speak to us today and educate our listeners on what it is you do. And I appreciate you indulging me on some questions uh, about the appointment of uh, Justice LaSalle. Uh, happy to have the discussion with you. And again, I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And to our listeners, we'll speak to you next week.